the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. Today, David Downing and Aaron Hill and I, Crystal Downing, are going to be discussing the important book that ignited C.S. Lewis's journey to faith. And this is going to be an interesting conversation because Lewis himself didn't consider it great literature, and yet it transformed his life. The name of the book is Fantasties, written by George MacDonald, published in 1858. And C.S. Lewis was waiting at a train station at age 17. By that time, he was pretty much a hardened atheist. He was desperate for something to read, and he bought a copy of this novel, Fantasties, again, out of desperation. And he says it baptized his imagination. So we're going to start with that idea. It didn't mean this book did not bring C.S. Lewis to faith. It brought him to the point where he realized that his atheism might be limited, that perhaps there is a world beyond that which is empirically verifiable. So, David, since you are an internationally known C.S. Lewis scholar, tell us what you think really grabbed Lewis's attention about Fantasties, even though he recognized it's not great literature. Well, I should mention that it's the title is spelled P-H-A-N-T-A-S-T-E-S. Fantasties. People often say, have you read his fantasies or his uh, Fantastica? Yeah. Uh, Fantasia. It is the same. Fantasia. Uh, hi- <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm just. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same root word as fantasy. It means appearances, actually. Uh, the word epiphany has the same root, an mm. appearance of the divine and even cellophane. It appears, oh, it appears to be what? clear. Yeah, cellophane is the same root. Fantastic. David, if you guys didn't know, David uh, moonlights as an etymologist. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I love uh, word histories and word origins. Uh, well, Lewis himself said that he crossed a great frontier when he first read the book. Uh, he says, quote, It had a sort of cool morning innocence and quite unmistakably a certain quality of death, good death. What actually did to me was convert, even baptized my imagination. So Lewis loved fantasy stories that were imbued with spiritual values. Uh, He liked Dante. He liked the Fairy Queen. He liked Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, And so this is a a more recent example. But he loved the fact that you're in the world of fairy, you're in the world of imagination and wonder, but there are these underlying spiritual values. So I believe that's what captured his imagination. Uh, He also liked David Lindsay's Voyage to Dark Tourists, which is not a very good novel, but they it has a lot of features that Lewis liked, like these creatures had these tentacles that came out of their chest, and when they touched you, they could empathize with your thoughts and feelings. Uh, mm. wow. To me, that sounds like a bad episode of Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but Lewis loved using science fiction and fantasy to evoke spiritual realities. When did he read Spencer's Fairy Queen? Because I know he loved Fairy Queen. We talked about that last podcast. Um, I, he read everything early. I okay. bet he first read it in his teens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For him, school was classics, Crete and Latin. Oh, and right. And recreation was not Netflix or volleyball. It was uh, <laughs> Spencer, Shelley. One of his books, he says, it's yeah. like the schoolboy who secretly reads Shelley on his own after. And yeah. I go, you're Ooh, the, yeah. Percy Bysshe Shelley, wow. You go, Jack, you're the only one who ever did <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Everybody else has Superman comics. <laughs> well, not back Shelley. then, though, there wasn't that much for entertainment. But I, I asked about the Fairy Queen and when he may have read it because there is a Fairy Queen mm-hmm. in Fantastics. Right. yeah. And the trouble is the central character doesn't obey her directions. But we need to go back to the very start of it. Should we do a quick plot summary? Yeah. Why don't you do that? Well, uh, why don't you do that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try because okay. there's some things I want to Le- mention. Okay. Let's just start about the very opening. Um, because I fantasies, think... Fantasties. <laughs> a, a fairy tale for, for growing up. It okay. actually starts with a very long quote from Novalis. Yes. It does. Um, and um, what... Uh, okay. I'll answer then my own question. 
it it begins with a guy named Anados who is his name means uh, no way or he's lost his way. Right. Odos is here we go again, Aaron. I know. I know. <laughs> it's the way like odometer, and oh. A is the alpha privative, which means the opposite. Like atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. So no so, way. Yeah, Anados literally means no way or lost his way. So. Anados, he's kind of a rich kid. His his father has just died, left him a castle. So he lives in this castle uh, in Great Britain somewhere, we assume. And he is enchanted by this big oak desk of his father's. And so he opens it up and he keeps wanting to see beyond initial cubby holes to cubby holes behind cubby holes Mm -hmm. and he finds a key to get inside and what strikes me is that is so similar to the idea that that c.s lewis decades later puts into his great fiction you go inside more inside more inside a wardrobe and you get to another world so he's kind of copying that concept but what Anado says he opens this desk and finally gets into a secret um, compartment in the back of the desk he encounters a fairy lady who jumps out of the desk and so she was totally tiny like Tinkerbell and suddenly jumps out and is full grown woman. Well he makes a comment on how can I take you seriously you're so small and she says form is everything size is nothing and then she grows to human size to accommodate him but once again that has kind of spiritual interest just like Aslan who looks bigger as the children get uh, more mature in their perception of him. If we keep analyzing at this level of depth, yeah. this will be our first six-hour <laughs> yeah, podcast. Say, yeah. Well, that I that reminded me of Lewis, so I, I'm not going to do that with everything. Okay, but... well, one critic, said, one critic said this is the first portal fantasy, where you start oh. out in the real world, oh, and yeah. suddenly the bedroom turns into fairyland. So they yes. actually gave McDonald's credit for inventing that device yeah. as a portal. Oh, well, not cool. just portals, but mirrors and, and all kinds of, you know, there's a lot of, with mirrors in there. He's going through doors. I mean, every right. time he walks through a door right. or goes behind a curtain, he's going into a new different place, right. you know? Right. right. In fact, uh, during our last podcast, we had this great conversation with Wade board member Graham Shea, who was talking about Tolkien's book, Smith of Wooten Major, and the whole issue of allegory and that Tolkien was responding to MacDonald and not liking MacDonald's allegory. And the best way for me to understand Fantasties is to think of it as not explicit allegory, but very allegorical. After all, we know, as we talked about last time, that MacDonald loved Pilgrim's Progress. His whole family would put on productions of Pilgrim's Progress. And this, his first novel, so he had thought of himself as a poet first, but most Victorians um, thought of themselves, if, if you take literature seriously while well, you write poetry and novels, that that's for... Uh, non-intellectuals. So he ended up writing this as his own allegory towards regeneration. I wouldn't call it allegory exactly. Um, He himself said that it presents suggestive shapes yielding no satisfactory meaning to the mere intellect. Uh, In Um, Pilgrim's uh Progress, you know the giant is despair. You know the slew is despond. When we meet the marble lady or the beech tree, uh, it's not always clear you can't put an exact label right, on Right, right. So that's why I said veiled allegory. It's kind of like when people accuse C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe of being allegorical. Right. And he says, no, it's a supposal. And I, I think MacDonald is doing a similar type supposal. Because one of the things that struck me, just as in um, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, this anecdote as he enters into the woods, and he's led into the woods, he keeps finding different cottage structures and each one of them gets more problematic. So first he encounters a 
cottage where there's this old woman and a girl who put a book in the window, which is uh, about um, Arthurian literature, and they are totally attuned to fairy and the fairy world. But, but the husband is not. Right? No, that's the second cottage. Oh, okay. So the first time he gets people who totally embrace fairy, mm-hmm. then he finds a second cottage where the wife embraces it and the husband poo poos it and yeah. said, Yeah, well, well the but hus- he's the husband and the son, and then it's sort of a male female thing where the, the right. mother and the daughter yes. embrace it, but the husband and the son right, don't. Right. But the husband is very kind about it and the, the son is real snarky yeah. and sneers at the belief in fairy. And then the third cottage is just this woman reading and telling him uh tells Anados, uh, whatever you do, don't enter into that closet. And of course, he does. He doesn't listen to the advice of more wise people. Mm. And out of this closet comes a shadow, a darkness that overwhelms him. And so what you see is his um, progress, or you might call it regress, Mm -hmm. um, from openness to fairy and encountering dissatisfaction and disenchantment with fairy. And actually, McDonald uses the word disenchant multiple times. And what's interesting about that shadow is that when Anados leaves that third cottage, the shadow actually kills flowers, kills grass. Yeah, everything it It touches. It kills the glory of creation and totally, total disenchantment, which is, of course, what atheism is, is that, no, there's no God, no creator. This is just all um, explainable through scientific fact. Yeah. yeah, I would say that McDonald's influenced by <clears throat> Jung's idea of the anti-self for the shadow, except that Jung uh, hadn't written anything yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, but right. It's very Jungian, the, the dark side that follows you, and it could be uh, disbelief. I think it could be excessively analytic thinking rather than accepting things with wonder and openness and receptivity like a child. Right. So can I, can I mention the epigraph that he includes from Novella? Sure. Because I feel like that really kind of sets up what he's trying to do here and how it's it's different than most literature that you encounter. So I'll just read a, a few things from it. This is a translation from the German. I'm not going to read the German. Uh, he says, one can imagine stories without rational cohesion and yet filled with associations like dreams and poems that are merely lovely sounding, full of beautiful words, but also without rational sense and connections. And then he goes on to talk about Puisi and fairy stories. And he says that they're uh, like a vision, a harmonious whole of miraculous things and events. Um, They are miraculous, mysterious, and interrelated. Everything must be alive, but each in its own way. And so it's, it's something for him that's, you know, it's fantastical. There's images. Um, they're, su- they're kind of related, but they're not related. And they're not necessarily meant to communicate something specific. And so it's, it, that's why it's, it makes it hard to talk about, well, what's the plot of Fantasties? Because right. it's, it's a thousand different small sort of interrelated yes. stories. Right. Right. Uh, and because he's miss- wandering and yeah. just encountering right. these different things. But there is a type of progressive or regressivism, and then a return back. So can I ask you guys a question then? So one of the key things is when he gets to Fairyland, he encounters this knight who looks sad and dejected, mm. and he warns him He's about... He's a tin man, and he says, oh, <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a different story. I'm sorry. That's a, that's different, a different story. story. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, in the first part of the book, he's described as a sad knight. And then later on, yeah, he he comes back. He comes back. and uh, But when he encounters him, he warns him about the ash tree yes. and the alder tree. And it's a very cryptic sort of warning. And you're like, what's going on with the trees and all this kind of stuff? And then when he gets to the first cottage that you mentioned, where the lady is enchanted and she helps him see the fairies that are living in her garden, she's very afraid of the alder tree and right. the ash tree. Right, right. And they're watching them and things like this. And so he goes out and then he almost has this encounter like he's being stalked by like a vampire or something. Oh, right. Right. And it's the. But, and that's the first time a shadow. Yeah. It's, he sees the shadow of a hand. Yeah. Because yeah, he gets down on the ground and he looks up and then he can see this like long bony hand or whatever. Yeah. It's very gothic almost. Yes. yes. And then he he runs, he runs, and he, finally he runs into a beech tree. And the beech tree is a woman. Yes. And she embraces <laughs> him and kisses him and loves on him. And he feels uh, at home. And so one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about there feels very much like there's a 
uh, I don't know the best way to say this, so I'm just going to say it, sort of a sexual coming of age element to this story where, but there's also a matronly element where he's constantly finding women that right. uh, very much give him sort of motherly love and he weeps and they hold him in his arms. But then he's also longing for women in different various instances yeah. and stuff. Well, and, for an ideal woman, I wouldn't call it sexual, it's just much the idea of finding that mm-hmm. ideal partner yeah. Well, it's kind of subliminally sexual. Um, I think part of the reason Lewis responded again, he'd lost his own mother. Yeah. And he was seeking mother substitutes. But the Mrs. Moore, there's this question of whether or not they had a sexual relationship right. early on. So I think there is okay. kind of a sorting between spiritual beauty versus sexual beauty. Yeah. Uh, he wrote this when he was 34. So he's a relatively young man when he's writing this story. Uh yeah, alders and ashes. Are they softer wood than oak? Because it says, trust the oak. I have no idea. Yeah, and why well, the beech yeah. tree well, can it I, has a woman's spirit. Yeah, can I read a uh, just a quote sure. from the very first chapter when he encounters the woman who's also his grandmother, who was oh, the yeah. fairy that grows yeah. to a large size. <laughs> Again, this is, it's really hard to, yeah, it's, when you describe it, it sounds like you just uh, crazy. Did, did LSD or something. Especially when she says, I'm 237 years old. And <laughs> yeah. you know, why 237? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why not round it off? Yeah. Right. Um, he looks into her eyes and her eyes are very blue and it evokes the blue flower from uh, Henry uh, Don Van Offer- Offerding. Again, Offerding Novalis. From Novalis. Um, but he says, eagerly, I did so as he looks into her eyes. They filled me with an unknown longing. I remembered somehow that my mother died when I was a baby. I looked deeper and deeper till they mm-hmm. spread around me like seas and I sank into their waters. I forgot all the rest till I found myself at the window whose gloomy curtains were withdrawn and where I stood gazing on a whole heaven of stars, small and sparkling in the moonlight. Below lay a sea, still as death and hoary in the moon, sweeping into bays and around capes and islands, away, away, I knew not whither. Alas, it was no sea, but a low fog burnished by the moon. Surely there is such a sea somewhere, I said to myself. So, you know, he, this happens to him as he's looking into her, her blue eyes, and it mm-hmm. evokes this sense. But I, when I read that, I thought, that must have really grabbed C.S. Lewis about his mother dying when he's young right, and yeah. the right. sea, because it feels very much like Atlantis and the longing of the sea. It's right. very, very romantic image. That's um, also good writing there. Um, yes. McDonald would go from kind of sophomoric writing to yes. this beautiful yes. eloquent prose. Yes. yes. Um, there's another one when he uh, swims in a lake, he plunges into uh, the water, and it's similar to the one you just read. He says, the blessing, like the kiss of a mother, seemed to alight on my soul, a calm deeper than that which accompanies a hope deferred bathed my spirit. I felt as if once more the great arms of the beech tree were around me, soothing me after the miseries I had passed through and telling me like a sick little child that I should be better tomorrow. The water themselves lifted me as with loving arms to the surface. So that's Mm. another one of those great uh, passages that I think would have resonated very strongly Mm. with C.S. Lewis emotionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's a, a lot of those moments where he encounters a woman that's very matronly that embraces him mm-hmm. and he finally feels safe and assured. And um, I have, David and I both had the annotated edition, which was put out well, by Wing and Lion Press. who for you. <laughs> and, and we recommend it. Uh, yeah. Edited by John Pennington and Roderick McGillis. It's really first rate scholarship on his sources and the German romantics. Yeah. Uh, his life. And it has all the reviews. Mm-hmm. One of the reviewers said this is a secondhand symbol shop. <laughs> <laughs> but other ones were very generous. Yeah, so yeah. Mm-hmm. if you're struggling with Fantasties, I definitely would recommend getting this oh, annotated yeah. edition. Yeah. It's very similar to people that we encounter visiting the Wade. And some will come in and just say, oh, I just love George MacDonald. And others would say, you know, I just don't get George MacDonald. Right. So he, he's, he, um, he, he's an acquired uh, taste. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. And some of it, I like some of his more realistic novels and earlier podcasts. We yeah. discussed that. We but I'm, we need, I'm fascinated with the fact that this was the important book yeah. that set C.S. Lewis on his journey to well, faith. So, so there's kind of uh, two other themes I wanted to ask you guys about. So one of them is uh, sort of preoccupation with death. 
uh, uh-huh. which I'll come back to. But the other one is the there's this figure that keeps popping up, and we've talked about her before in McDonald stories, this old matronly mm-hmm. woman. And in the annotated edition, they mentioned that uh, she often represents nature, and they actually quoted McDonald himself saying that this is how he tends to view nature as this sort of old matronly grandmother right. type right. person. Um, and so there's constantly this theme of being interrelated with nature and then being disillusioned and not being interrelated with nature. So when he visits the cottage the first time, he actually eats some of the food in fairyland and all of a sudden he can hear like what the squirrels are saying Yeah, and he can understand the birds. He can see the spirits in the flowers. Yeah, but he can also hear what they're saying and understand them as if they were speaking English. And so he's this sense in which they're interrelated. And then when he visits the second cottage and he talks to the husband, he literally says in there, I did not believe in fairyland right and then he meets the girl and he says i did believe in fairyland Mm -hmm. and when he doesn't believe in fairyland he can't hear what the animals are saying and he doesn't see anything fantastic in the woods so like the man goes out and he's like yeah it's just woods i don't see anything but it's because his eyes sort of haven't right. been opened right. to this other world. Again, reminding us of Lucy, who sees Aslan, yeah. where her siblings don't, but because she believes he is there and hence can see him. Yeah. There's a fragment of Magician's Nephew uh, that Lewis started called uh, the Le Fay Fragment. And it starts out with a little boy who can understand uh, trees and animals, but then his uh, next-door neighbor, a little girl, convinces him to... Uh, cut the branch off a tree to make a raft. Oh. And as soon as he does that, first of all, the tree slaps him while he's trying to cut <laughs> off the tree. And the next day, he's lost his ability to uh, talk to animals. Uh, so when I, was that written? It was it was written in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, he was having trouble of doing Magician's Nephew. Oh, yeah, no. This is C.S. Lewis, Narnia Chronicles. Oh. Um, and he was having trouble with it, I think, because it was so autobiographical. Mm. Uh, but once again, the influence of MacDonald is... Yeah, wow. He was read MacDonald his whole life. He didn't just read this one book. He said, when I finally became a Christian, I realized that MacDonald had been with me all the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and in his introduction to this book that they have reprinted, he says there's... I, don't, I can't think of anything that I've written where McDonald hasn't right. been yeah. an influence behind it. So all that to say that uh, that sort of matronly element to me is very interesting because he's turning 21. He's becoming like a grown up. He's yeah. no longer right. a boy. He's taking on all these responsibilities. And there feels very much this sense of um, wanting to grow up, but also not wanting to grow up. And so I he won't grow up. <laughs> I to go to school. He grows back and forth between that. And uh, there's a quote in here. I think this is from chapter seven. Uh, He says, I should have ill endured the day before to be called a boy. But now the motherly kindness of the word went to my heart. And like a boy, indeed, I burst into tears. Oh, right. This is after he. um, So there's an episode. He he gets chased by the, the ash tree. And then he gets embraced by the beech tree all evening. And then he goes and he finds a cave where he sees this woman that's like carved in marble. And he sings to her because he can all of a sudden he can sing in fairyland and he sort of brings her to life. And but when he brings her to life, she's like terrified and runs away from him. And so he goes and he chases her. And then again, he finds uh, he, he comes into like another cave and turns out that she was the alder tree and she was, you know, a uh, like tempting him and then here comes the ash tree and then the knight chops the tree and saves him or somehow and so he's he feels very um uh vulnerable and like he's been taken advantage of and he's done something wrong and so that's when he runs to this woman at the second cottage and she calls him boy and he just bursts into tears mm. so there's this this ongoing element of like not growing up or being afraid to work, grow up that uh stands out on the novel but then mm-hmm. the other one I wanted to talk about was this embracing of death mm-hmm. And not, uh, there not being a fear of death. So Novalis wrote a series of hymns called Hymns to the Night. He had a, a, a girl that he was in love with and she died. And he, he writes all these hymns and the night represents death. And so he's writing all these hymns about death and the life that he would have had with her if she hadn't died and stuff. And uh, MacDonald loved these hymns. He translated them from German into English mm-hmm. and he would actually give mm-hmm. them to people as gifts uh, and they're published in a, a number of different places. Um, and so there's this element of Anadose is not afraid of death, where he he almost embraces it, because it's a part of Zenzucht in German, is this sort of longing for death. Mm. And it becomes a strength of his at the end when he meets these other two 
uh, young men, these knights, and they decide to fight the three trolls. Right. And right. He realizes, the giants. Yeah, actually. yeah. And he realizes they have the bravery and they have the strength and they have the armor, but the one thing they don't have is his, you know, lack of a fear of death. And so he sort of completes their trio by saying, you know, hey, if we die, we die. And then, of course, obviously they die and he doesn't. But um, that theme of not being afraid of death is a very interesting mm. theme in the story. And I don't really know what to make of it. But um, Well, what happens right afterwards, though, is he takes great pride in the fact that, mm. hey, look at me, I saved the town. And I mean, he, he was, um, he honored the other two men who were actually the sons of a king until the giants took over the kingdom. And he goes and releases people. And um, that is another misstep of his. So he was willing to participate with these two brothers to fight the giants, but then takes on this pride until he meets the um, a, a knight who is clad in armor like himself, and it's a reflection of himself, of mm. arrogance and pride. Yeah. And that knight has to put him in a tower prison yeah. for Anados to confront his own pride. And what's significant about that, too, is that what pulls him out of the prison is he hears this young girl singing outside. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that she was someone earlier in the narrative where she had this glass globe and he wanted to possess it. And that, you see, is a um, motif throughout the text is he wants to have things. He is told to follow a certain path. He takes a different one. Yeah. He is told not to touch go, something. Yeah. Not to yeah. touch something. He touches it. Not to go through that door, he goes through that door. And so, so there's a type of arrogance and pride that has to be kind of beat out of him. And that is part of his shadow because when he is absorbed with himself, he loses enchantment of that which is outside of himself. But the little girl who sings, he had stolen her globe earlier and broke it. And she, at this later time, forgives him. Yeah. And so he's learning about people who put love of the other above self-love. And I just see his whole journey is a journey of trying to release himself from self-love and getting what he wants to serving others. And he literally says that in the text. Yeah. And didn't the didn't the shadow return when he was feeling so prideful? Yes, it, it did. A symbol yeah. that yes. His dark side is reemerging. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's good analysis. Yeah, he um in that in that section, right, as the woman is singing to him, he literally says in there, My heart sprang with joy. Oh, to be a child again, innocent, fearless, without shame or desire. Um and so as he's as she's singing to her, and so then he hears her voice singing and for him, that's sort of this um, return to innocence or a recognition that the world doesn't have to be about him. Um, I was actually going to find another quote about that, but um, that return to innocence is a thing that he longs for throughout the story. I wanted to go back to your comment on death. Right at the end of the story, he, he, uh, Anados gets killed by a giant wolf, and then he says he discovers, discovers that even death itself is not dangerous. I was dead and right content. I lay in my coffin with my hands folded in peace. I felt as if a cool hand had been laid upon my heart and had stilled it. My soul was like a summer evening after a heavy fall of rain when the drops are yet glistening on the trees in the last rays of the downgoing sun. The hot fever of life had gone by, and I breathed the clear mountain, the land of death. I had never dreamed of any such blessedness. Mm -hmm. And once again, I think Lewis... The whole idea of an afterlife where you died, but your consciousness goes on. I think mm. it really appealed to him uh, that when you start thinking about spiritual realities, physical death may not be the end of things. Right, yeah. right. And what's significant is when he does die, he is dying in the process of rescuing other people right. yeah. from this wolf. Right. Yeah. So it's so, he's not thinking of his self anymore. He's thinking of the yeah. needs of others. And that's part of his process of his transformation. Yeah, well, he has to take off the armor that he gets <laughs> after, after he defeats the trolls. He goes and he takes the two sons to the king and, you know, everybody 
fawns over him and uh, you know mm-hmm. and then he gets uh, this you know really beautiful armor and he rides off with his shadow and then he encounters so uh just to kind of fill in the gaps here the woman who sings that he sings out of the marble and then who's also a woman who's a marble statue in this palace that he sings to life yes it's the same woman she ends up being the wife of the knight who right. warns him earlier in the story. And the knight sort of redeems himself by killing the ash tree and saving him in the process. And then he also saves a girl. It, it gets very complicated. But towards the end of the story, when he gets uh, the girl whose globe he broke, who's in the tower, and she sings him out of his shadow, at the end of that chapter, he realizes that he's probably more fit to be a squire than to be a knight. Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. realization that he doesn't have to be the hero of his own story, Mm -hmm. that everything doesn't have to be about him, brings about this transformation. And I wanted to read just a little quote of that. He says, um, Then first I knew the delight of being lowly, of saying to myself, I am what I am, nothing more. I have failed, I said. I have lost myself. Would it have been my shadow? I looked round, the shadow was nowhere to be seen. Mm. And then he says, I learned that it is better a thousandfold for a proud man to fall and be humbled than to hold up his head in pride and fancied innocence. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to talk and he says, uh, in nothing was my ideal lowered or dimmed or grown less precious. I only saw too plainly to set for myself a moment beside it. Indeed, my ideal soon became my life Whereas formerly my life had consisted in a vain attempt to behold, if not my ideal in myself, at least myself and my ideal. And now he understands that, uh, he says, another self seemed to arise. Doubtless this self must die again and be buried again from its tomb. Self will come to life even in the slaying of self. And so he, he in this moment, he realizes that, you know, like you said, part of his problem was his pride. He needs to lay that down. He needs to view himself as humble. And then uh, the sort of, resolution of that is the knight comes along after slaying a dragon and he says hey can i be your sire you know i'll just Mm -hmm. you know i'll stand here by your horse and he realized he doesn't have to be the hero anymore Mm -hmm. and then he sees the knight and how noble he is and he cares for this wounded girl and so for him it's this transformation so that at the end he can then fight the wolf and he's not afraid of death and he actually ends up becoming a hero by sort of laying down his uh, pride Mm-hmm. And I think that part of the reason uh, Lewis and, and other readers respond to McDonald, it's not so much the plot elements as these beautiful passages that are imbued with, with spiritual values of selflessness, mm-hmm. not fearing death. Uh, we have a Russian scholar who comes to the Wade and translates a lot of McDonald into Russian. And I asked her about uh, what she's doing with C.S. Lewis. And she said, oh, yeah, we're also doing a lot of C.S. Lewis books. But there's something about McDonald that, that speaks to the Russian soul. Hmm. And I think it's passages like that that speak to the Russian soul. Hmm. Um, We need to talk about the ending of the book. Uh, Hmm. He says at the end, after he's come back, he was, he's 21 years old and he was gone for 21 days. But at the Hmm. end of the book, he says, yet I know that good is coming to me. That good is always coming though. Few have at all times, the simplicity and the courage to believe it. What we call evil is only the best shape, which for the person and the condition of its time, could be assumed by the best good. And so, farewell. That's the end of the whole story. What does he mean by that? I tripped over it the way you tripped trying to yeah, read the, it. The prose is a little odd. I think the idea is what we think of as evil is the best that God can give you in your current circumstances and your current state of maturation. Oh. That's the way I interpret it. Like when he's trapped in the tower, it seems evil, but it was a necessary stage for him to go through, you mean? I think it's something like that. As I say, he, he was gone 21 days, which seems to represent one year of a young life of 21. Um, yeah, sometimes when we're <laughs> summarizing the plot, people are going to go, no, that was that was Monty Python, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to go, are there uh, coconuts in this story that are clopping along? Yeah, it's very hard to describe the plot of this story. Right, I, because it's episodic. You could read them. Well, yeah. it, except that's why I was trying to think of, is there a logic? to the way the episodes are put together. Right. And that's why I started seeing this progressionism of the cottages oh. in the order that mm. um, he places them. And he is moving towards disenchantment, has to get, he gets re-enchanted, but then gets pride from the re-enchantment. Yeah. So he has to give up on that yeah. and finally sacrifice his life to essentially be 
and literally in the story, he is born again. Yeah. There's also an element, I, I first read this when I was in college, and so maybe these things were fresher on my mind when I was younger, but there's an element where he's he's chasing the girl when he sings her life out of the marble. He chases her. Yeah. Because he's like, well, she's going to be my perfect wife. Yeah. And, Possession. Again, he wants to possess mm-hmm. And these he does things. the same thing with the girl. The girl's like, no, you can't touch my globe. And then he touches it and it breaks. And um, But when she sings him to life at the end, after the fairy queen has healed her, uh, he just lets her go, mm. right? He's just yes, like, he's like, yeah. thank you. And he just lets her go. And then when he encounters the knight, and the knight is the guy who's married to the woman that he's chased after two times. Uh-huh. Uh, and he even has a vision it's again, this is going to sound really trippy. He he goes to this old yeah. lady's house and I think the old lady represents time and fate. Yes. He goes through a door and he sees the, a vision of the night with the lady that he sung to life. And she says, yeah, I loved him. I was grateful for him for, you know, bringing me to life or whatever. But he realizes that she belongs to the night. So at the end of the story, when he ascend, ascends to be the squire of this night, um, there's a sense in which he's like, well... I recognize that you are meant to be with her and that she's not mine. I don't own her mm-hmm. and I can admire her. So he goes from pursuing her at all costs, even venturing like underground to see, you know, through these goblin tunnels. And he's willing to go to any length to try and be with her mm-hmm. to then realizing, oh, she's not mine. I haven't, you know, she's mm-hmm. not my wife. She's yours and you deserve her. So it's very interesting. There's a that sexual coming of age element where he's kind of pursuing women at any cost, mm-hmm. and then eventually or when he, idealized women, yeah, you know? and then when he and the, the comes symbol- to term with his shadow, he's able to say, you know, I don't need to, you know, I can let her go, you know, mm-hmm. let her be. Well, and that what you just described then is the fourth cottage where this, and it's actually the fourth cottage where he encounters the woman who. Um, makes him feel like a baby again, yeah. and he cries. Yeah. And he, the cottage has a door on each side, and so she has him go through one door at, that sends him to his past, oh where he lived on a farm, and because of him, uh, because of his selfishness, his brother dies. So he's this woman is forcing him to go back through his life, and then it's the second door she sends him through, where he witnesses that the lady. Lady is now married to the knight mm-hmm. and loves him. Then the third door, he encounters this old girlfriend. And what's fascinating is the girlfriend dies and turns into marble. So it's almost like yeah. his earlier um, episode of finding a marble later lady who turns into a female is trying mm-hmm. to reverse that experience. Yeah. And then finally, he wants to go through the fourth door, but the woman um, warns so him the against it. The fourth door is a brand new car. <laughs> Congratulations. No, I'm uh, no it's, it's uh, the fourth door is timelessness, yeah. but, which represents death. Yeah. But it's like she prevents him because because she knows that it is better to for him to encounter death by doing a sacrificial act rather than trying to grasp after Senzo, yeah. as they say in the German. And that's exactly what C.S. Lewis is writing about in Surprised by Joy and Pilgrim's Regress, right, David? Is this grasping after Senzucht, wanting to possess it, is not the answer. Yeah, that's the theme of both Regress and Surprised by Joy, is it's only a pointer to what you really want, which yeah. is to rest in God. There's a whole subplot called the Cosmo episode, and we haven't talked about that because we're going to devote a separate podcast to just that story. He goes to a library. Our characters in uh, George MacDonald often find these wonderful libraries full yeah. of books. Right. And so there's a story within a story, but it also Two stories have this, within the story. Yeah. This theme of uh, renunciation is very strong in that story. Yeah. Right, well. right. But as I was reading it, uh, rereading it again, I did really feel like there is this element in which he, especially when he goes through the doors and he encounters the regret over his brother, because they have like a fight right before they go to sleep. And then his brother wakes up mm-hmm. and goes to bathe in the river and then he drowns. Mm-hmm. And then he's he feels horrible regret over fighting with him and not, mm-hmm. you know, making up before they went to sleep. And he thought, you know, the last thing that he heard from me was, you know, these mean words. Uh, and so he's filled with regret over that. And it's sort of a loss of innocence. And then the story with the girlfriend, again, it's the sort of loss of innocence and heartache and heartbreak. And I feel like there's a sense in which he's dealing with like not hardening his heart, 
not um, becoming disillusioned and becoming mean and cruel in the story as well. And so he's constantly encountering these moments where um, he's just overwhelmed with emotion, with crying and stuff. Uh, and so, I don't know, it's, it's a very interesting story because Anidos is kind of all over the place emotionally. But I think McDonald is kind of trying to take you through those different stages as well. I can see how this would have resonated with the Lewis that lost his mm. mother at a young age. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think so too. Uh, and a lot of these passages were talking about their real life emotions. You could say, I don't get what's going on with these good and evil trees. I don't get what's going on with <laughs> all this other stuff. But uh, Lewis said, when I read other fantasy literature, when I closed the book, the, the real world seemed kind of dark and dim in comparison to these people having all these wonderful adventures. But he said, when I read MacDonald, the bright shadow of reality comes off the page and gives a certain warmth and radiance to my actual life. So I think a lot of these spiritual lessons we're talking about, he uh, really felt, oh, this is true of reality. This is true of my psychology, my need to grow. So I, I do believe it's that applicability that made Lewis uh, so strongly attracted to yeah. this kind of literature. There's a quote he has when he's talking to the, um, the, two, the two guys. He encounters these two young men, and they're making armor, and then, like I said, to they're— To fight the giants. To, to fight yeah. the right. giants. Um, and they're, they sort of tell him their backstory, and one of them had fallen in love with a woman, mm. and then he's—but he's, he's got to go defeat the giant, and he says, you know, I'll come back to you, and then obviously he never does. But then um, the other one— uh, uh, he's talking to them. He sees, I see to what the powers of my gift must minister. This is Anidos talking to them. He realizes what he can contribute. For my own part, I did not dread death, for I had nothing to care to live for. But I dreaded the encounter because of the responsibility connected with it. So I think one of the things that also stood out to me was the sense in which uh, taking responsibility and recognizing limits and prohibition, like we said, there's he's constantly being told, don't go here. Don't do this. Mm-hmm. Don't sleep. You know, the at the first cottage, she's like, you probably shouldn't sleep out on the forest at night. Mm-hmm. And, then, <laughs> and then he's like, no, I think I'm going to take a nap right. and then I'm going to go uh-huh. hang out in the forest at night. Right. He just, uh-huh. you know, and so he just, he constantly can't deal with it. And I think there's a fear of re- responsibility uh, and what brings to it. When he's 21, he's not afraid of dying, but he's afraid of responsibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the end of the story, he sort of comes to take responsibility for others and protecting others. And he, I don't know. This was an element of growing up to it. Yeah. Yeah. That, definitely, again, definitely. I think what I think would have ministered to a C.S. Lewis that was striving to grow up and become an adult or maybe thought he had already become an adult, but hadn't dealt with some of these things from like his mother and his father. I well, think he's 17 when he reads it and he, the protagonist is 21. So you can see uh, how he mm-hmm. would feel a lot of relevance to his life and his uh, spiritual experiences. I also think that Lewis may have resonated with the fact that the um, epigraph of the very first chapter is from Percy Bysshe Shelley's Alaster. And I know that Lewis loved Shelley. Yes, and he did. there are echoes of this long poem by Shelley. Uh, <clears throat> and here is how Shelley himself prefaces his poem called Alaster. And the, the subtitle is The Spirit of Solitude which is very similar Mm. to antidotes. He keeps finding these people, but then leaving and just Mm. um, not obeying their wisdom. And Shelley says that the youth in Alaster has adventuresome genius who's led forth by an imagination inflamed and purified through familiarity with all that is excellent and majestic to the contemplation of the universe. So long as it is possible for his desires to point towards objects thus infinite and unmeasured, he is joyous and tranquil and self-possessed. But the period arrives when these objects cease to suffice. And that's just what we've been talking about with Anadose. And it actually... In part of Shelley's Alaster, he gets in a little boat and is just kind of taken along to a place as he keeps seeking his ideal, which is kind of a um, manifestation, a longing for something that is not expressing love for the other, but love for his own personal ideal. Mm. That's what's going on in Fantasties. So I think Lewis resonated with that element as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I, I really recommend this annotated edition, they also give the reviews. 
Uh, they go everywhere from someone saying, it's an unreadable riddle, to another <laughs> reviewer saying, this is one of the greatest works of pure imagination in English literature. Mm. Mm. So if mm. you like it or if you don't like it, there's there's a precedent for your attitude or your reaction. Yeah. There's a lot of I think it, varied I, responses. I think it's helpful to kind of calibrate your expectations going into it. Because I right. remember reading it in college, just knowing that it was influential for C.S. Lewis. And then I tried to read it again when I was an adult, uh, I was in my twenties and I went back into it and I, I, you know, I had forgotten so much of it cause it's not like there's a coherent plot. Right. So I went into it going like, oh, okay, I'm going to figure out what the plot and what everything means. And mm-hmm. it was just like, it was impossible for me to uncoat. And you know, back then this annotated edition didn't exist. So it was impossible for me to make sense heads or tails of it. And so I just kind of gave up about halfway through. Mm-hmm. I was very dissatisfied with it. But this last time, knowing more about it and knowing the sort of the connection with Novalis and having read Henry von Ofterdingen, um, I kind of knew more what to expect. And so I was able to just kind of let things go. Like you just, you know, like, I'm not really sure what to make of that. So I'm just going to keep moving on to the next page. Right, right. And in the annotated edition, they have this section at the end talking about the assessment. And I just wanted to read a, a quote from it. You mentioned a part of this, David, but I just wanted to mention a longer section. He says, McDonald's symbols are purposely vague. They work through what McDonald's calls poetic suggestiveness. The quotation from Novalis at the beginning warns the reader not to look for coherence in the romance, as in dreams, symbols can slip from our understanding and change their significance. Thus, the white lady can represent art, nature, and the divine, while she is a statue, and later she is nothing more than mortal and feminine. The shadow is at times the rational spirit, at times the spirit of pride and selfhood, Such slipperiness accounts for the difficulty of symbolic writing, but this difficulty is deliberate. Quote, a genuine work of art must mean many things. That's MacDonald talking from Dish of Orts. Uh, And then he said, the artist need not define or explain his work. The work of art that needs, MacDonald says, quote, this is a horse written under it is not a successful work of art. Great analogy, great analogy. So he's, you know, I think that's helpful if you do decide you want to read Fantasies, which I, I would encourage people to, at least give it a try. Mm. Uh, but know that going in, it's almost like you're reading sort of vignettes and suggested dream in, sequences. Yeah. Dream mm-hmm. sequences. Yeah. That, well, it's fitting that in the story, he, he goes into a dream and he wakes up in a different place. Mm-hmm. And then, right. he, well, that's right. why I compared it to Pilgrim's progress because it's episodic and these different and dream experiences right? yeah. that are shaping his worldview. But you get the sense when you read Pilgrim's, uh, that, that there's a meaning behind like, okay, well this means something. Yeah. Well, it's explicit allegory and yeah, explicit right. allegory is, doesn't take much analysis. Yeah. You go, this represents pride. Whereas this is more implicit, which makes it more fascinating for me. I yeah. don't particularly like explicit allegory. Um, but, uh, I think a good place for us to end the conversation about this is what Anadose has come to realize after all these experiences And this is also what Percy Bysshe Shelley is, um, the point he is making in his poem, Alaster. I knew now that it is by loving and not by being loved that one can come nearest the soul of another. Yea, that where to love, it is the loving of each other and not the being loved by each other that originates and perfects and assures their blessedness. Mm. Another uh, shorter theme is trust the oak. <laughs> <laughs> the Wade Center podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.